happy holidays from all of us at TVO. Welcome to Booker King, the speculative fiction and comic restaurant. Our motto is, have it our way. I'm Richard, I'll be your editor this evening. Tonight, our McFiction special is the All You Can Read trilogy. If you like TV dinners, I'd recommend the Star Trek novelizations. Our regular theme anthology serves six to 1,600 authors. And if you're famished for ideas, there's authors sharecropping each other's work. But the house specialty is the shared world books. Several chefs, cook up the same ingredients into a different entree. What's good? Well, it's all good. The Shared World Novel, safe choice. Nancy, a number six. Enjoy. Anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe has voted English only sign. Mm. 40,000 tons of fuel with PCBs blew up the ozone layer today. Standing by for solid rocket booster separation. Jim, a friend faxed me an interview from Interzone magazine where you objected to fiction written to order, and yet you've had stories in the what might have been books. Isn't that a bit hypocritical? I do, I do have a, a moral objection to what I call fiction to order or the, the whole um, phenomenon that's peculiar to science fiction of people collaborating, people uh, sharecropping, uh, each other's worlds and braided novels and that sort of stuff. It, it seems to me at some level, you know, the opposite of, of art. You know, it seems like uh, literature by a committee. Um, however, <laughs> I've been known to participate in these shared worlds, or at least in the case of the what might have been stories, shared premises. Gregory Benford, the author, challenged us to come up with uh, an alternative use of a hero or an alternative piece of history, what he called failed events. Um, I did it because it's hard to turn down a sort of sure, sure publication offer. And you know, you want to get your name around. A lot of frustrations in trying to carve out a career in fiction. Tough, tough business. So I figured, OK, I'll compromise to, to the degree that I'm appearing in a, in a shared world. But what I found is that I was able to make these stories pretty personal. I was able to work through themes that matter to me and that are, they became Moravian stories as they evolved. I think maybe there's a distinction to be made between uh, inhabiting someone else's universe, using somebody else's characters, and simply coming up with a story that fits a theme. Yes, there's a world of difference. Theme anthologies like the What Might Have Been books spring from a common inspiration. Shared worlds use common location, history, and characters. In speculative fiction, shared worlds are a recent and hugely popular phenomenon. In comics, they've been standard practice for decades. It's sort of like a soap opera where a bunch of different writers all work with the same characters. So are shared worlds the TV of literature? SF critics often dismiss shared world novels as 20 authors in search of a plot. Fans say they're entertaining and fun. The most popular is the fantasy series Thieves World, created and edited by Robert Lynn Asprey. In 1979, Robert set up his trademark town of Sanctuary and then peopled it with a mini-series worth of colorful characters. The 12-volume series features stories by some well-known authors, including John Runner, Marion Zimmer Bradley, Diane Duane, and C.J. Cherry. C.J. is best known for her Hugo Award-winning space opera novels, Psy Teen and Down Below Station. 
but she also helps Janet Morris edit her Heroes in Hell's Shared World, and she's mapped out her own Merovingian Knights anthologies. Carolyn, a friend faxed me up an interview from Locus Magazine where you stated that the shared world is a new literary form. How so? Um, in that you have a group of writers working together. Writers are very solitary animals. Um, they don't communicate much with each other. Um, but when you get a plot going, which is not a collaboration, um, it's, it's a new sort of creature. Um, I had been part of Thieves' World, and I'd been part of Heroes in Hell, right. and I decided that I wanted to try one of these on my own, but that unlike the others, I had the experience of seeing what happens when they run on to the point that they are now complicated beyond anybody's ability to figure out what's going on. And my notion was to follow one plot to its conclusion and stop. The interesting thing happens also within the body, within the group of writers, because the writers are meanwhile interacting with each other. And there comes a point at which it's almost like working a Ouija board. Collective movement begins to take the thing in this direction. And if you try to carry it much further, the writer's ideas of what should happen are going to become so diverse you can never again get unity. So um, it is. It's a very odd thing to work. It's unlike anything else I've ever done. Um, it's fun, and it's one of those things that I always feel should stop while the writers are still good friends. Heaven forbid literature should upset friendships. The other major player in the shared world marketplace is Wild Cards. Creator George R. R. Martin imagined an alien virus infiltrating America after World War II. It produces the Wild Cards a stacked deck of superhero characters. The good guys are aces, the villains are jokers, the chips are down, and it's winner take all. George, it's Rick. What are the advantages and disadvantages of the shared world setup? There are those who don't like shared universes, who say that there are disadvantages because you lose the individual vision um, of a writer, and I'm not going to make that argument for you because I don't believe it. Uh, I think there are more advantages than, than disadvantages. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting form, the shared world, and I think it's a relatively new form. You can trace its roots back through literary history. Actually, hundreds of years you can find precursors, but very rare ones. Mostly it's a modern phenomenon that we're seeing in response to Thieves' world. Um, it's complex. It's hard to do, particularly the way we do it. I mean, I think we've gone beyond the other shared worlds. We've developed a form that we call the mosaic novel where it really intertwines. It seems like a lot of hassle getting eight or a dozen authors to write like one. Why not just have one person write the story and give it a personal vision? A lot of us, I think, in our books, where we are expressing our personal visions, will have characters who embody uh, the things that we disapprove of or the philosophies that we don't like or views on the world that we don't agree with. And these will be the villains. And sometimes they'll be straw men, depending on the skill of the writer. But uh, certainly they'll be overcome by the characters who embody our personal visions. But you're a writer, you're doing that, and there's no one arguing that other thing. You can put whatever arguments you want in the mouth of that character. In a shared world, you get some interesting things where that doesn't happen. Um, at the end of the seventh wildcard book, for example, my character and John Miller's character, who are the two principal protagonists in that book, you know, really come head to head on they've, they've caught a murderer and now what to do with him. And there's a whole question there about vigilanteism or, you know, um, trusting the system, taking justice into your own hands. Now, if either of us had written the book alone, you got a very simple ending. You know, I end it one way, John ends it another way. But neither one of us agreed with the other one's thing. So you get an ending where the two characters embodying our two different views, you know, come right up against it. I think it's a very exciting scene, mm -hmm. but it's also a very real scene. It's, uh, there are no straw men there. Mm -hmm. Both characters are presenting their own best arguments and their own strongly felt ways of dealing with things. And who acts as the final arbiter or referee? Well, as editor, I do most of the time, although it's a little trickier when I'm also the writer involved, like in that case, then I have to rely to a certain extent Melinda Snodgrass, who's my assistant editor. Um, road referee on that particular scene. <laughs> Thanks, George.